My milling machine is powered by a variable frequency drive and recently it stopped working so I'm going to take you along as I wire up a brand new VFD with an external control box to get my bridge port running again. I've been wanting to expand the setup of my VFD and after my old one crapped out on me during the Christmas rush I was forced into making a change. I got to looking around and apparently the Tico VFD that I was originally using was replaced by the new Tico L510 series. I was able to set up my original VFD thanks to a few very helpful videos by Mr. Pete 222 where I basically followed his instructions. Hooking up this new Tico L510 wouldn't have been possible without the in-depth VFD installation series by another YouTuber named James whose channel is Cloud42. James takes you step by step through the process of replacing the motor and adding a VFD to his grizzly lathe. His videos are super insightful and packed with tons of knowledge, so if you go down in my video description, I'll have links to his videos. I pretty much followed along and built my VFD enclosure using the same components that James did. If you want to see an extended version of how I got to where I am, then check out his playlist. There was just one problem for me. His videos were way above my pay grade. He glossed over some things that might seem straightforward to him, but were totally foreign to me. I've never worked with an AC contactor before. To be honest, I had no idea how they worked until this project came up. To get the breakdown of how AC contactors work, check out my description for a link to a video by Electrician U. So without further ado, let's get to setting this thing up. Here's the VFD box most of the way set up. I left the contactor out so that I can briefly go over how it works and what wires go where. And then I left the fan out just so I have a little easier access to some connections. So a contactor is basically an electromagnetic relay. To activate the contactor, you need to apply the hot leg of your circuit to a certain terminal and the neutral leg of your circuit to another terminal. These are marked A1 and A2. A1 is set back all the way up here and then A2 is set back all the way down here. Now, we wanna control the contactor remotely using a switch in the control box, so we're not gonna directly hook the hot and the negative to the A1 and the A2 terminals. According to the instructions that come with the Tico VFD, they recommend that you have a circuit breaker before, which is this right here, and a fuse after, which is this right here. This is a fuse holder, and this is a circuit breaker. I also chose to include the input noise filter down here just to stop any interference that I might have with other electronics in the shop. I do have a small LCD TV nearby, but if you don't have any other electronics, then you might choose to skip this filter. But for $15, you might as well throw it in because there's plenty of space in the box. I've compiled an extensive list of all the parts that I use and put links to them in the video description below. So the hot leg or the black wire. Now this is 120 volt North American wiring that I'm dealing with. The hot comes into the top of the circuit breaker. It goes out of the bottom of the circuit breaker, comes up around here and connects to terminal 5L3. This is a normally open connection between this top terminal and the bottom terminal mark 6T3. When the contactor is activated remotely, it'll switch this connection from normally open to closed, meaning that the current can now pass through from 5L3 to 6T3. From terminal 6T3, it now goes to the top of the fuse holder, around that way, up to the top of the fuse holder, through the fuse, and out of the bottom to the noise filter. The neutral is actually gonna come in to 1L1, right here on the top, and the same way that's gonna come out on T21 on the bottom. This is normally open, and then it's gonna switch to closed when the contactor's activated. To test all of these things out, you can just push on this, and it'll switch these connections from open to closed and closed to open and all that stuff. The jumper wires that you see on the top and the bottom, those are required for making this into a latching connection, and I'll explain that a little more when we wire in the control switches. Generally, you have the hot go to the A2 and the neutral go to the A1. So we have a neutral jumper right here from the A1 to the line in. The neutral is actually always going to see neutral. That's going to be on that side. But now the hot, since we have this going to the front, which this is a switch connection, the hot is only going to then see hot when we tell it and we give it something from up here, and that's gonna come from the switches. 
So let's get this screwed into the box and then I'll start taking this one step further. Before things get too crazy and crowded in here, there's a couple grounds I wanna add. It's one from the VFD frame up to this ground terminal up here and one from underneath the hot side of the noise filter, there's another ground and that's gotta go up here too. So before I tie the neutral and the hot into here, let's get those grounds situated. This is exactly why I left this fan out. We do have one more ground that's gonna come up here. That's the input from the outlet. So I'm just gonna get this in place kind of loosely. And now we can tie the output from the bottom of the fuse to the hot and the neutral from 2T1 to the neutral on the noise filter. I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Now I have the bulk of the internal wiring done. I can go ahead and get the fan in place. So basically the fan will turn on at the same time that the contactor is activated because when the contactor is activated, it sends a signal to these two terminals, which in turn will power up the wall adapter and turn on the fan at the same time as everything else. I'm setting up the fan for the bottom and where the knockout holes were that I cut around to make the vent, I did have to notch the edge of this fan grate just a little bit so that it'll sit and give a nice seal. Now I have the fan all hooked up and I took this DC adapter and I soldered the fan wires onto this so that when power is applied to here, it's gonna make the fan come on and power will be applied to here when the contactor turns on. So the fan won't be on unless the contactor's on and everything else is live. So let's just get this Mount it on the side, put a few ring terminals on here, and attach it to the one side of the noise filter. You can see the two openings on the top. This is gonna go out to the three-phase motor, so that motor right there. This is gonna be the input from the wall. It's gonna have a cord with a plug, so it'll come in there. It'll come this way. The ground is gonna attach to this ground right here. The hot will come into the top of the circuit breaker. The neutral will go into 1L1, which is that right there, which is the same one as that jumper wire. And then the neutral comes out, goes to here. The hot comes out of the bottom of the fuse, goes to here. You have, so when the contactor turns on, that's gonna energize these two wires. In turn, that's gonna energize this DC power supply, which is gonna send power to the fan, which is blowing in this direction. And then from the out of the noise filter, these don't matter which way, you can switch these two. Just make sure I was reading some of the reviews on these line filters, and some people were saying they had a mistake with the sticker where it's flipped upside down. That is gonna matter. This needs to be the line side. This needs to be the load side. The line side has the ground on it. So if for some reason you see it say line on the one side and there's only two terminals, it's wrong. The sticker's upside down. So you're gonna want to have the line and you can see there's a ground in the circuit right there. That's that ground back there. So like I said, you could have the neutral across the top or the neutral across the bottom, as long as they go the correct one to the correct one. So, and the orientation of it matters, the line side and the load side. And then, so it comes out and you have your hot going to the line L1 and your neutral going to the L3, the neutral. And these are gonna go to your three phase motor. We're gonna get all that connected up next and I'm probably gonna test it out I'll run some wires and make sure everything's okay. Then after that, we're gonna build the control box.
I have this old metal box that sat on the side of my milling machine and it originally housed three fuses. I believe it was some kind of switch. There were three fuses for the three phase and you could switch it off with like a lever. But it was bolted to the side of the milling machine. And what I thought would be a good idea would be to use this as the control box. It's a little bigger than it needs to be, but I thought for the nostalgia purposes, it'd be kind of cool to have the original box that came with the milling machine used for something new, like controlling a variable frequency drive. So let's um get this cleaned up. It's pretty disgusting. I mean, some of this stuff is from me, but some of this grime is probably about 100 years old by now. I'm probably going to sandblast the box, cut some holes in it, mount some switches, and then mount it right next to the milling machine. You know what I just realized? There's probably about a thousand percent chance that this is lead-based paint. So I think I'm gonna rethink sandblasting it. I'm gonna think about it. Got the VFD box mounted to the wall and before I go ahead and hook up the control panel wiring I just wanted to test things out and make sure that everything turns on once I mount the control panel it's gonna be tough for me to get in and out to access all this stuff so right now it's plugged into the wall and nothing's happening when I flip the circuit breaker still nothing should happen because the contactor is not activated so Circuit breaker's live. I did put a fuse into the fuse holder. So now when I push that little black button on the front of the contactor, I should get power to the VFD. All right, the VFD's on, the fan's running, everything looks good. All right, let me uh, go ahead and mess around, make sure the mill comes on and everything, and then I'll start setting up the control panel wiring. You might also notice that I rerouted the wire going to the motor and I added these ferrite rings and that's because of Cloud42's video. So if you want the explanation all that, go check out his videos later. Basically, they're 10 bucks for 10 of them. So I figured I might as well add it. It's not going to hurt. I wired up all the wires for the control panel. It just makes more sense for my application to do it now and then work my way back just because of the location of the control panel. So I'll go ahead and I'll put a screenshot up on the screen right now, and it'll show you where each of these connections goes to. Here's the control panel. I finally have an e-stop for my milling machine. So you push it in and reset it. This is the forward and reverse. I've never used my milling machine in reverse, but it's good to have. And then I have the potentiometer. And you can see I left some spaces. Some of it is for how the switches sit, but I did want to leave a spot right here because there's a slight chance that I'm going to put a tachometer. I've had one for a long time, but I've been meaning to set it up. I can for now just use the numbers. I have a handheld tachometer so I can get readings and then, you know, write a chart and say 50 is X amount of RPM and 30 is X amount of RPM. But it would be kind of nice to have a digital tachometer right up here to show me the exact speed as I run through it. Not needed, but maybe I can add it in the end. And if you flip it over, you can see the wiring in the back side. I separated the low voltage and the contactor wiring 
into two different bundles and I put different ends, female ends on the contactor bundle and male ends on the low voltage bundle going to the VFD. Just so I can't mix up the red and the red, it's not possible, the white and the white. It's basically one set of wires can go into one connection. And that way I could remove this face if I have to change any switches, I don't need to rewire everything. The rotary switch is basically gonna get its yellow from the common, comes in, there's a jumper, so both sides forward and reverse have one side ready to go, and then when you switch it, you're sending the power to either forward or reverse. These go straight to the VFD. Tangiometer wiring is blue, green, and white. So that's all your low voltage stuff right there. And then the contactor wiring is up here. The black is the common in, so that's gonna get the hot leg from the contactor. And that's gonna send it over here. So when the e-stop is pulled out, you have current coming through. That comes this way to your start switch. That also comes back out to one side of your contactor on one of the front latch connections. So it's coming up here and then when you push you're sending a signal to the contactor telling it to latch. And then this jumper wire right here, this is just going to send a current to the LED. And then this is the neutral coming from the contactor to light up the, the LED switch right there. I'll put a diagram up on the screen. It'll show you where everything is, what wires go to what terminals and everything kind of mapped out for you. So I guess it's the moment of truth. I have it plugged in, circuit breaker is on, e-stop is pushed in, so there's no power going to anything. So let's see what happens. Okay, so lights on when e-stop is out, so I know that there's power going here. I could also change the wiring and make it so that the light turns on when the contactor is active, but I'd rather have it like this so that I can make sure that all right, so now, now I know there's some kind of power. I could shut it off and nothing's going on inside the box. So turn that on. So now when I push this, the VFD should power up, but it's down and it's on zero, so nothing should happen. Well, that's awesome. Hopefully, if everything's right. Oh, you know what? Real quick, I need to program because I won't have any control from the potentiometer. I need to reprogram that. Another thing, when you first set up the VFD, let me grab the book real quick. So right out of the box, the VFD was only coming on and staying on five hertz. That's because it was set to, you would have to change the hertz by up and down. It wasn't relying on the potentiometer. So uh, let's see. Main frequency source, menu code 00-05, main frequency source selection was set to zero keypad. So I had to change that to potentiometer on keypad, which is one. So now let me just change the control method. Now I need to change the uh, main run source selection, code 00-02 needs to get switched from keypad to external run stop. Okay, now it looks like this is at zero, so that should be at zero. Now when I turn this up, yep, awesome. So now we're controlling it from the potentiometer. And the only thing, I did change the ramp up speed. It was like 10 seconds before. I think I changed it to three seconds, something like that. So now when I click forward, it should turn on. Okay. And like I said, I've never used reverse, but I've got it now.
So that's gonna do it. I can finally get my milling machine up and running again. It's been out for a couple weeks now. This has been a lot of work, not gonna lie. A lot of staring at wiring diagrams and a lot of watching videos. I can't say thank you enough to the video series from Cloud42. I really wouldn't have been able to do this without his videos. Link in the description below. Extensive link of all the parts I used, everything I got, every single switch. I will put a link to pretty much everything minus like the box because you don't have to buy your own to make your own. I really like the way this came original to the milling machine and still matches, still has the same paint. So if you like this video, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and I'll keep making more of them. And I'll see you on the next one.